Hi, uh, welcome everybody uh, to the last Cavalry conversation of the semester. My name is Dan Fagan, and I'm a professor of journalism uh, here at the Carter Institute of Journalism at New York University. I'm also the director of the Science, Health, and Environmental Reporting Program and the Science Communication Workshops. So we're very heavily invested in the business of more and better science communication for the benefit of uh, our fragile democracy here in the United States and around the world. So for this reason, I'm especially excited about tonight and very grateful to David Wallace-Wells and to Michael Mann. Uh, it's an honor to have them both here. Uh, and I, while I will leave the uh, formal uh, introductions to Lee, I do want to say that the fact that they were both willing to come, in Michael's case, uh, all, all the way from Penn State, uh, means a lot. Uh, and the fact that David was willing to come and talk about a, a story that generated a lot of heat and also a lot of light, uh, uh, well, I'm really grateful for, for that, too. Uh, for the formal introductions, I'll leave it to Robert Lee Holtz, uh, who is, of course, uh, as always, our highly intelligent, esteemed, erudite moderator uh, for the Cavalry Conversations. He is the science writer at the Wall Street Journal and a distinguished writer in residence here at the Carter Institute. So, Lee, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Fagan. I'm always wondering how that sentence is going to end. <laughs> um, so welcome, everybody, to the Cavalier Conversations on Science Communications. Uh, for our conversation tonight, we turn to climate change, um, science journalism, and the proper role of the scientist in communications, and all the twists and turns of conveying new research. A leading uh, researcher who has, uh, uh, in addition to their uh, own scientific contribution, has made a point of reaching out to the general public about their work, and a, an esteemed science journalist who covers the field that that scientist uh, works in. And with those two, we will explore how they best bring the general public into the community of discovery. Now, these conversations are sponsored by the Cavalier Foundation and the NYU Science, Health, and Environmental Reporting Program uh, under the directorship of Dan Fagan. So uh, just to reiterate, as we go, um, this is not a lecture. This is a conversation. So I encourage all of you to uh, politely, respectfully interrupt us, di make us digress, make us go up uh, the interesting blind alleys that uh, a good conversation will lead. And when you do <coughs> that, please use the microphone. And for those of you who are watching this online, uh, please uh, tweet us your questions uh, using the hashtag Cavalier Convo. Now, as science journalists, as environmental reporters, as medical writers, as concerned scientists, we entertain, we inform, we challenge, and when it warrants, we want to warn uh, the public, our public, about impending threats of future harm uncovered by our reporting of new research. And that goes to the heart of the central purpose it goes to our place in the scheme of things. On our best days, we are the tripwire. So in that spirit, few issues these days attract quite so much coverage and controversy as climate change. And here we face a problem. Uh, the Atlantic recently put it very nicely when they called climate change um, a stuck issue in American politics, uh, polling, continually points to a larger conclusion. Global warming is highly partisan. Uh, most voters do not consider it uh, particularly significant to them personally, even if they are worried about it. Now, a recent Yale poll uh, put it very starkly. More than 50% of Americans believe that climate change will, quote, harm people in the United States, unquote. But fewer than 40% believe that it will, quote, harm me personally. Interesting. Um, and there is a better, it's like a four in 10 chance among those people that, uh, uh, that they believe that there's a better than even odds that global warming will actually lead to the extinction 
of the human species. Now, given those sorts of feelings, it's curious that we're stuck, quote, of 50-50 uh, in this country about what to do, how to go forward, how much attention we should pay. And that's where, of course, uh, we come in. What's the right way to get their attention? What's the proper balance? What's the proper language? Should we worry about messaging? Are facts enough? So, you know, if humans are doomed, what's the best way to break the news? So we're joined tonight by David Wallace Wells, who's deputy editor at New York Magazine, where he also writes about science and what they like to call the near future. Um, and he is serving as the uh, trampoline, if I, if I may put it that way, from which we are going to jump into this topic. <laughs> so you were wondering how that sentence was going to end. Um, because uh, we're going to take as the text for our conversation this evening um, uh, a, a New York uh, Magazine cover story that it ran in July, uh, this past July, uh, on uh, the worst case scenarios for, for climate change uh, and, the, and the globe that we inhabit. And it's interesting that this was the most read story in the 49 years that New York Magazine has been publishing. Uh, and it evoked an interesting and... Uh, uh, passionate response amongst many people. Uh, David um, uh, also writes the Tomorrow column um, at the magazine, which kind of goes into the future of science and technology. Uh, he uh, uh, began there um, as literary editor in 2011, became features director in 2016, and he also oversees the magazine's uh, collection of podcasts in addition to his other duties. Be interestingly to me anyway, before joining New York Magazine, David was deputy editor at the uh, Paris Review, where he edited and published writers such as Anne Beattie and Warner Herzog and Jonathan Franz and Jalcom, Janet Malcolm and others. Uh, he's a graduate of uh, Brown University, where he trained as a historian. And he is, um, uh, curiously, a native New Yorker, that rarest of things in the village. <laughs> Um, and he uh, makes his home in Manhattan. On my immediate left here, uh, we're joined by Michael Mann, um, a pioneering climatologist at Penn State University. And now he's known primarily for his 1999, uh, 1999 hockey stick graph, which has became a, a kind of touchstone for um, uh, climate denialism and uh, sustained sort of political attack on the veracity of uh, climate science uh, by uh, uh, both uh, industrial and congressional uh, forces in the U.S. Um, he also was uh, a key author and has been steadily involved in the uh, UN uh, IPCC reporting process. And he's written more than 200 peer-reviewed papers. He's published three books. Um, the first is uh, Dire Predictions, Understanding Global Warming. Uh, the Hockey Stick in the Climate Wars, Dispatches from the Front Lines, and then together with uh, co-author Tom Tolles, The Madhouse Effect, How Climate Change Denial is Threatening Our Planet, uh, Destroying Our Politics and Driving Us Crazy. That one came out last year. Um, you can see how the subject has evolved. Um, so <coughs> much of the public conversation about climate is couched in predictions, hypothetical scenarios and threats of dire harm to future generations, um, never quite to us. Um, so what I'd like to do here is start by asking you each how you come to this issue, um, how you, David, come as a journalist, and you, Michael, as a science communicator. David, you're a uh, literary editor. Uh, you're coming out of the tradition of the Paris Review. Um, how do you come to climate coverage, and particularly this story? As a journalist, I mean, that was, um, I think it's sort of a simple story. I was looking at a lot of news out of science and reading some academic papers, sort of, um, you know, some darker corners of the internet, and just saw a story that hadn't been told really dramatically in a publication like the one that I was working for. And, um, you know, I'd been following climate news for a while. I'd, you know, as you said, interested in science for a while. But um, sometime over the last year, a year and a half, <coughs> it just seemed to me that 
you know, I was seeing more and more quite scary um, stories, um, especially about new research that was coming out about climate. And I felt as a, as a reader that, you know, the mainstream media like the publication I work for had done a relatively good job of communicating um, what I think of as basically the kind of median outcome for climate change, which is probably two, maybe two and a half degrees of, of Celsius of warming, um, and had done a reasonably good job of communicating the issue of sea level rise, um, but had, to my mind, not really done a very good job of communicating all of the other threats that climate poses to us, and had not really broached the subject, or I should say successfully communicated to the public, um, the whole second half of the bell curve beyond the median outcome, what the 75th percentile outcome was going to be, what the 90th, 95th outcome was going to be. And so I set about trying to sort of combine those two stories to look at um, what things would look like if climate was considerably worse than we were expecting um, and to spell out all of the many ways that that could affect us. And to your point about that, that Yale um, survey, <coughs> You know, and, and the, the fact that most people think of um, the threat of climate change as being um, you know, directed at people maybe in the United States but often elsewhere in the world, um, I was really hoping to, to the extent that I was working as a kind of advocate, which is really a secondary purpose for me, to shake that perception and show through extreme weather, through effects on agriculture, through public health effects, through all of these different scenarios, that climate change was going to affect everybody on the planet, change the shape of every life on the planet, and that we couldn't comfort ourselves by saying, well, I don't live in Miami, I don't live near the sea, I'll be okay. Um, and we can talk a little bit about, more about how I went about doing that, but that's, that's yeah. basically how I okay. embarked so, on the project. Michael, you're coming this from the other side of the fence. I mean, in a way, um, you know, David's in the business of seeking public attention. I mean. Uh, uh, public attention kind of found you. Yeah, that's right. Um, back in the late 1990s, uh, now nearly two decades ago, as you alluded to, uh, my co-authors and I published this um, now iconic study uh, and presented this curve called the hockey stick because of its shape. Um, it was an estimate of how temperatures have varied over the earth over the past thousand years. And, it had the shape of a hockey stick, which is to say there was this blade at the end, which is the warming of the past century, um, which has no precedent as far back as you can go along the handle of, of that hockey stick. Uh, and it became an icon in the climate change debate, I, I think because um, it told a simple story. You didn't un need to understand the, the, the complexities of climate science, uh, the, the physics and the mathematics of its climate system to understand what this graph was telling us, that there was something unprecedented uh, taking place today in our climate. And by inference, it probably has something to do with us. Um, it probably isn't a coincidence that it coincides with the Industrial Revolution. And because it really, presented such a simple story, it was perceived as a threat by some pretty powerful uh, special interests <clears throat> um, who uh, have been looking to discredit uh, the case for concern over climate change. Um, fossil fuel interests who don't want to see us uh, move away from fossil fuels towards renewable energy, um, climate change poses a threat to them because the underlying source of the problem is our continued burning of fossil fuels. And, the increasing concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, so I, as a uh, postdoc, uh, a fairly young scientist at the time, um, suddenly found myself in a world that I had never expected to be in. When I double majored in applied math and physics at UC Berkeley, when I went off to, to Yale University to study theoretical physics, and then eventually moved into uh, climate science. Little did I realize that um, I was setting out on a path that would eventually lead me uh, to the very center of one of the most contentious societal debates that we've ever had, uh, the debate over climate change and what to do about it. Um, so, you know, as a scientist, um, that is a bizarre world to find yourself in. It's, uh, science doesn't train you for that. Um, but I found myself um, at the center of this um, raging uh, debate, and I decided to embrace that. It's not what I signed up for. It's not 
you know, how I expected to be uh, spending my time, my life as a scientist. Uh, what, you know, got me excited about science was the thing that I, I, I love to do the most, which is um, trying to solve interesting problems, uh, using inventive methods to, mm -hmm. to get solutions to interesting outsi mm -hmm. uh, outstanding problems. Mm -hmm. Um, but my scientific work led me into this entire diff entirely different world. It led me into the center of this debate. Yeah, and I've embraced to interrupt that. you for yeah. a second because you're yeah. kind of, you keep calling sort of it a debate yeah. uh, in the country, which sounds sort of, yeah. you know, nicely low key, but we're really talking about you were targeted by the Virginia State Attorney General. You were been dragged before Congress a number of times, your integrity questioned. Yeah. Uh, you finally, I think, resorted to uh, uh, legal action uh, to sue your critics for defamation because they were accusing you of fraud. Um, this has not been a, uh, a uh, low-key academic uh, uh, controversy that you have uh, not at embraced, all. <coughs> if I may say, whether you liked it or not. Yeah, not at all. Um, it, in science, you expect to be involved in, in good faith debates over what the data show, over whether your hypotheses hold up. There's a certain um, approach to doing science, there's a certain set of rules um, by which science is done. <clears throat> and here, all of a sudden, you find yourself um, in a world that's governed by very different rules, um, where your critics don't necessarily observe the, 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 the standards of uh, scientific, uh, legitimate, good faith scientific debate, where it's about a, a character assassination. It's about ad hominem efforts right. to undermine your credibility, um, even leading to threats against your livelihood mm -hmm. and your life. Um, mm -hmm. That's not what scientists expect to have to be mm -hmm. doing, but that is where I found myself. Now, and I'm gonna go back to David here in a sec, but I wanna, before I leave you, many people would have reacted to that kind of pressure, uh, particularly many people who are, you know, for lack of a better phrase, we'll call the scientific temperament, contemplative, uh, interested in their uh, particular field of study, uh, like a quiet uh, place to think about things, would have withdrawn. Um, it's quite striking that, uh, quite to the contrary, um, you have embraced uh, the combat of, of uh, public uh, policy. Um, I should have mentioned, I didn't, that among all of those other things, you are uh, participant in the Real Climate blog with uh, Gavin Schmidt and others. Gavin has been a guest here yeah. uh, before, and uh, uh, it just serves as a kind of reality check on a moment-to-moment -moment, uh, controversy. So you have really uh, embraced sort of the scientist as public communicator. That seems a little contrarian, given your well, circumstances. And heroic. <laughs> thank you. Well, it, I agree, <coughs> and heroic. Well, thank you. Um, as I said, it's not what I set out to do. Um, I would have uh, perhaps uh, very much enjoyed the contemplative uh, life that you describe and, and just sort of working on interesting scientific problems. But because my path led me to this, you know, again, the center of this contentious debate, I ultimately did embrace that. I accepted that, you know, whether I liked it or not, I was going to have to defend myself, I was going to have to defend my science. But now I was being used, and my science was being used as a proxy to undermine the public faith in the science of climate change writ large. And so there was a greater responsibility that I had um, to uh, not just defend myself, but to defend the science uh, against bad faith uh, attacks, against bad faith efforts <coughs> to discredit the science to advance a specific mm -hmm. uh, policy agenda. And uh, over time, I have grown to embrace that role. So it's interesting, and this is where the two of you kind of mesh. Um, your uh, work and the, 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 your first public act, if you like, the hockey stick graph, is a record of what has occurred. It's a record of the past. It's a, uh, it's a picture of, of reality. And David, your piece kind of picks up where the hockey graph leaves off. Um, it's looking at the uh, various dotted line scenarios that uh, kind of branch off from uh, Dr. Mann's uh, uh, reality check. So I'm curious why you took that approach. Certainly the reality is disconcerting and troubling enough. Um, why go for the worst case scenarios? 
Well, it, I should I should tell you all. For I apologize for those of you who hadn't read the headline. The the lead uh, uh, headline on the magazine story was the uninhabitable Earth. Um, was kind of the tone of the piece. So. Yeah, it connects to what I was saying before in answer in you know response to your first question. Um, I thought that people like me. Um, I'm not an environmentalist. I have n very little background in that. I have very little, I mean, I'm a native New Yorker, as you said. I have very little affection for nature. I've not really thought of myself <laughs> as like, I'm not a, you know, an animal lover. I'm not an atheist. I've never gone hiking. I've never gone camping. Um, <laughs> and I felt, you know, pe that people like me who are sort of well-informed, um, progressive-minded, um, you know, relatively well-off people in the West, um, mm -hmm. Had a, had a relatively well-informed sense of, as I said before, something like what we think of as the median outcome for climate change. And I thought that there was something really missing from our conception that we didn't appreciate that that median outcome was a median outcome. We thought of it because it was sort of the worst picture that we had been sent. We thought of it as something like a worst case scenario. And that can be really distorting on how you think of what's likely and what's possible. If the worst thing you've ever heard is that it's going to be 80 degrees and the best, the coldest is going to be is 20 degrees. You're, you're, you know, that's one thing. If you know that it's possible that it could be 120 degrees at the beach, then that's going to be a whole different um, set of calculations you make. And um, I felt, you know, there was a kind of public purpose in, in doing that. I did think that um, in order to think about what's likely, we it helps to have a good sense of the extreme fringes of the bell curve. But I also, as I said before, I, I went at it really um, primarily from a storytelling, um, out of a storytelling impulse to showcase um, what was possible and had been sort of um, insufficiently portrayed by media publications like my own. And the way, you know, the way that I did that was um, I, I, I took the, the UN's projections, um, which are not perfect and probably already a little bit out of date, but basically the best that we have for sort of consensus view of where things are going. And um, I should say the projections for what would happen if we, if we don't take action on, on climate. Um, and took them to a bunch of scientists who studied particular subfields and, and asked them, well, if we get to four degrees of warming, what would that look like for what you study? If we get to eight degrees of warming, which is sort of the freaky end of the, of the bell curve for the next century, what will that mean? <coughs> and, um, and then I, yeah, then I published those answers almost verbatim. I mean, in some cases truly verbatim, in other cases in ways that I summarized and then showcased mm -hmm. for the scientists mm -hmm. to approve. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I, I really wanted to, as I said before, do those two big things to, yeah. to make sure that people understood that there were really? many worse possibilities out there and to show them that it was a much bigger, more complicated story than sea level rise. Well, see, what in, was interesting, I think, about the reaction to your piece, which was very strong, was that um, it had a lot of detractors, and the detractors, surprisingly, were not the sort of usual climate denialist things. They actually, a great many of them were climate experts um, and, and other reporters. And the issue, I mean, certainly the, with a long piece like that, there are often technical quibbles or and there were certainly a couple of those, but that by and large the overall uh, objection would kind of be summed up by just simply saying it was too scary, it was too bleak, it was too alarmist. And I think you framed, you called it doomist framing, Michael. What do you mean doomist framing? Yeah, um, and, and I think it's un unfortunate because, um, <laughs> well, well, the way that, the, that, just that, that debate uh, became framed, um, you know, uh, often when you have differences um, on social media, on Twitter, uh, there's a tendency for it to devolve into a, a food fight, and it's very difficult yeah. to have the more nuanced discussions, which we're going to be able right, to have here. Right, we're having the nuanced discussion exactly, right now. Exactly. So, what did you yeah. mean by doom? In a nuanced <laughs> so, way, what did you mean by doom? I'm not trying to get you to throw yeah, a cupcake no, at you. I, I'm, I'm trying <laughs> to understand your point of view. And I, and, and frankly, um, I don't think David had any uh, role in. You know, uh, in the decision over w first of all what the what the title of the piece uh, ended up being, that was an editorial decision. He's um, an editor. 
Well, I don't know if that's a good title or your, I mean, your editor's I mean, I, title. I didn't uh, object to it, <laughs> in fairness. That's true, yeah. Reporters do get to object sometimes. But it's too. important because sometimes, yeah. um, you know, I, I have seen journalists criticized uh, over, you know, the title of the piece. Oh, um, sure. When they sure. didn't actually have a, have yeah. a role in that. And the title, you know, Uninhabitable Earth, obviously, that does sort of um, present a, 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 a doom and gloom scenario of sure. the future. Um, sure. And what... I was most concerned about, and, and my concerns were, again, you know, when I initially expressed them, um, I, 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 you know, my concern was that um, the framing, I think, uh, is sort of um, uh, unusually doomist, um, and it, uh, again, it, it, it sort of uh, devolved into, well, you're criticizing the piece. Um, the, the piece, by and large, I thought was a very good work of journal journalism, and, and David Sintz has done a, a re another really nice uh, article on climate for the New York Magazine. Um, and the, 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 the debate was really about, um, you know, the, the framing, uh, the title presents that sort of doomist framing, and there are uh, individuals out there um, who shall remain nameless who have said things like, uh, we are now, you know, um, destined uh, uh, for um, inevitable, uh, you know, societal collapse, um, that humans will go extinct in 10 to 15 years uh, because of uncontrollable climate change, and there's nothing we can do about it. Now, I find that, um, first of all, if it were true, that would be one thing. If that were legitimately the case, then we would have to deal with it. But it's not the case. And so instead, that sort of narrative can feed the very same sort of uh, sense of hopelessness um, and, uh, and aimlessness that outright denial of the science can mm -hmm. lead to. Um, it leads us to the same place. If you really don't believe that there's any agency on our part um, in averting uh, catastrophic climate change, then, then why act? Then why do anything? Then why, you know, change our way uh, of life? Um, and so I have become increasingly concerned that that un indefensibly doomist portrayal of where we are and where we're going um, can actually lead to the very same sort of paralysis, policy paralysis, that outright climate change denialism leads to. Um, and, I've, and I'm concerned that some, uh, there are some messengers who almost seem to have been co-opted by the climate change denialists, because that narrative, if there's nothing we can do about it, ah. then it, it leads us to the same place. Why, why yeah. move it? Now, I'm not saying that that's what no, 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 David no, doing. Please, please, um, no, no, no. But I, th I think He's, <laughs> we're going to all be friends when we're ending. This, this will well, end. We're ending. What about right now? Yeah. But so, that was, uh, uh, that's so. the context. It's important to understand that context, because that's the context into which right. I was sort of in interpreting, you know, David's piece. But now, do you yeah. see yourself as a as a messenger? Do you see advocacy as part of your uh, portfolio? Well, um, it's. Is that your problem? <laughs> It's a really complicated question to answer. I mean, I do feel now that I have that role. Um, uh, which? As a part-time advocate. Okay. I think, you know, um, in a much smaller scale way than Michael's experience, mm -hmm. but that I have been. I, I embrace, I, I think yeah. we are advocates. Who should have to apologize for advocating for a fact-based <laughs> discourse over what is potentially the greatest threat that we face as a civilization? Why should we have to apologize for being advocates for that? Yeah, I, I agree. But I would say, to, to, to your point, um, agency is really, really important. And I may have a slightly perverse view of this, but when I see this, when I see the story of climate change told, I don't have despair. I don't fall into fatalism. I was just actually doing a panel last night that was called Hope and Despair. And I think that um, when you see the story of what's happened, you realize that we are all the authors of that of those effects. And it's not, you know, the, it's not a 300 year story, although the, the 300 years has had an impact. It is in a really profound way, the story of just the last couple of decades. Mm -hmm. um, we're now at a point where we've emitted more carbon into the atmosphere since Al Gore wrote his first book on climate than in the entire hu history of humanity before that. And if you think that we've now brought our planet to where it is, just with those, say, 25, or if you want to think about it as a 50 or 75 year period, that's 
you know, then you look, you cast forward and you think, we have that amount of time to undo that damage, to stall the, um, the effects. And when I see evidence of climate impacts unfolding really large scale, you know, it's horrifying, it's tragic, it's scary, it's, you know, it's depressing. But it also reminds me that we are capable as authors of that degradation to undo it or to stop it. And I think that the proper response to seeing the damage that we've done is not to say it's all over, we might as well pack up and go home. It's to say this is proof that we actually are in control of this planet. We are the ones who made this issue. It's not an asteroid that's come from outer space and hit us. We are the, its authors and we can continue to be its authors going forward. Um, I mean, obviously, no matter what we do, there's gonna be some more suffering, some more degradation. But what stands between us now in 2017 and the worst case scenarios that I sketched out in my piece is almost entirely a matter of human agency. It's what we do collectively as a planet in responding to this crisis. And personally, um, you know, I have different, some different perspective on this than some climate activists, some climate scientists. I do think that fear is an important part of that motivating, of our motivating toolkit. Um, that if people think that everything is going to be okay, they may not take the kinds of actions that they need to take. And you know, as I look around, talk to my friends, talk to my colleagues, walk around the city, in general, again, just working through this sort of culture of well-off Western consumer culture, um, it seems really obvious to me that we're, you know, we're at risk of being too complacent and that the risk of being too scared is, it just seems silly to me to think about becoming too scared. Now, I know there are a lot of activists who you know, have given up hope. It's a really, it can be a really despairing situation to be in, and people who have devoted themselves to the cause, seeing very little progress, have dropped out. I know that's a real phenomenon among advocates and activists, but when I think about the broader public, I think that there are many more people who can be more turned on by climate fear than turned off. And I think that, I mean, I think the surveys are pointing in a bunch of different directions. You can read them in a bunch of different ways, but personally I see the data as supporting that. There are a lot of people, I think the number is something like 70%, who are concerned, who think global warming is real and are concerned about it in the US. But very few of them make it a, a top priority in their lives or in their political decisions. And for me, the main job of um, answering this threat is getting those people to be concerned about it as a kind of first order issue. And I think that, as I said, fear is a kind of a part of the toolkit for helping them. So in a very real sense, I mean, the data that you create as a scientist, you and your colleagues, I mean, is the raw material for what he and I and others in this room uh, do when we write about these issues. And so given that you spend an appreciable portion of your time also you know, wearing, wearing our hat and reaching out. I'm curious how you, how you uh, balance what uh, Stephen Schneider used to call the, the double ethical bind. Sure. How do you balance being effective against being honest as a scientist? Yeah, it's one of, uh, it's, it's amazing. Uh, Steve Schneider was sort of the Carl Sagan of our field. Um, he was a great climate scientist, but he was a great science communicator. And, and we lost him. Um, uh, I guess about now t almost 10, 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, uh, and it, it was great loss to those of us who, um, you know, for whom Steve had served as a, as a mentor and as a, um, you know, as really a, a figure um, uh, of, you know, who, who conveyed that you can both do science and participate in the public sphere and inform the, 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 the public about the implications of that science and, and, and there's nothing wrong in doing that. And there's a quote that uh, is often taken out of context um, to try to malign uh, Steve. It, uh, he was used to try to discredit him um, when he talked about uh, uh, inventing scary uh, stories. Um, so the double bind that you're referring to, there's a quote where he said, you know, we have to capture the public's imagination, so we invent scary stories, uh, but, you know, I forget the rest of it, but we have to be truthful um, uh, to what the science has to say. And that's sort of what, what he really meant. And in the end, uh, at the end of that quote, he said, you know, I hope that we can be, be both honest and effective. Um, that is what he, he saw as what we need to strive for. He wasn't actually saying that we should invent uh, scenarios that aren't faithful to the science. But what he was saying 
was that it is important for us to be faithful to the science and be effective at the same time mm -hmm. because our opponents um, are, aren't bound by that, that right. same double bind. They're not bound by the code, of eth the code of ethics that scientists observe, and they don't have to be faithful to the truth. Mm -hmm. um, and they're allowed to exaggerate so and misrepresent. Here's what he said. Yep, great, yep. Like most people, we'd like to see the world a better place which in this context translates into our working to reduce the risk of potentially disastrous climatic change. To do that, we need to get some broad-based support to capture the public's imagination. And that, of course, entails getting loads of media coverage. So we have to cough up, uh, up scary scenarios to make simplified, dramatic statements and make little mention of any doubts we might have. This double ethical blind uh, we frequently find ourselves in cannot be solved by any formula. Each of us has to decide the right balance between being effective and being honest. I hope that means being both. So what I want to know is how do you, Michael, juggle that? So, you know, it, as I said, um, so we are bound, you know, one of those double binds um, doesn't apply to the other side, to climate change deniers, the, those who attack the science yeah. and try to undermine the public understanding of the science, uh, don't have to be faithful to the science. They don't have to tell the truth. We, we do. Um, so you might say, well, that, that, that puts us at a disadvantage. But I honestly don't think it does, because we have one very important thing on our side, which is scientific truth. <laughs> and um, in the end, I believe that we can be both faithful to the science and effective. And David, David and I, uh, I think are in agreement, uh, 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 you know, on the vast sort of, uh, on much of what we've been discussing, uh, we're in agreement. Um, we're in agreement uh, on the fact that you can't just talk about the most likely, you know, the center of the bell curve. You do have to talk about the tail of that curve, um, the things that are unlikely, but if they happen, would be hugely costly, would be catastrophic. And, and Steve Schneider himself, um, was passionate uh, about that, about the importance of, of describing those unlikely worst case scenarios um, and characterizing it in the same way we might characterize fire insurance. We don't buy fire insurance, and this was the example Steve would often use, and it was a very effective example. Um, we don't buy fire insurance for our homes because we think our homes are going to burn down. That isn't the most likely scenario. It's a low probability scenario. But if it were to happen, it would be catastrophic to us. Mm -hmm. It would be uh, life changing, life ruining. And so we take steps to mitigate against that by purchasing fire insurance. Even though we know it's an unlikely thing, we still pay money now to insure against that, to hedge right. against that outcome. Right. In the analogy being, of course, that uh, mitigation, uh, reducing carbon emissions, acting on right. climate change, that's a planetary insurance policy. Sure. And, and we are in the business of, of selling. <laughs> <laughs> there you are. Um, so insurance. So I we ask a variation of the question of you. Well, can I, I just think. respond? Yes, please. I mean, I think even, it even goes beyond that in the sense that um, when you talk about fire insurance, you're talking about the likelihood that a fire is going to burn down your home. And there's, that's a binary situation. Either a fire is going to strike or it's not. And the thing about climate and what the bell curve really shows you on, on, on climate change <laughs> is that for every little tick upward of temperature, all of these things are going to get considerably worse. So when you talk about, say, the 5% you know, likely outcome, it's not just a matter of preparing for something that we have a 1 in 20 chance of, of getting to. It's the fact that you know, that whole slope of that curve is going to map out um, more dangerous, more and more dangerous scenarios. And that, so we need to be even more prepared for, its po for you know, those possibilities than we would if we were just saying, oh, we have a one in a thousand chance of getting to this point. Yeah, like all analogies, it's an imperfect one. And you're absolutely right. Um, people often will ask you, you know, they ask me, and I'm sure they ask you, what's the tipping point? Where, where, how much warming? Um, uh, before we hit the tipping point. The answer is there is no one tipping point. That's not the way it works. It's not binary. We don't go off a cliff. What it's, it, it, a much better analogy is we're walking out onto a minefield, and the farther we walk out onto that minefield, mm -hmm. the, the greater likelihood that we set off those explosives. So, so well, I guess what I want to ask you um, is, is it really, <coughs> and I don't know how else to put it, so I'll just say, uh, an accurate and honest 
um, uh, journalistic uh, depiction of risk, me really being honest and straight with readers about risk of a particular possibility in climate change, if you only focus on the worst case scenario. Now, I understand the, the, the theater of what you were doing, but... Um, well, I, th I would say I don't think that anybody should form their full picture of climate change based on my article at all. Um, I was trying to fill what I saw as a whole in the storytelling apparatus in that side of the risk tale. Um, and I did say in the piece, you know, several times, these are worst case scenarios. No, no, I think I it's can, unlikely that we're yeah. going to ever get to them and all that, all those kind of caveats. Um, but I do think it's, and it's important for us to understand that portion of the risk, of the tail risk. Um, but yeah, I don't think it's a complete picture and I wouldn't want anybody to form their whole view of things based on it. Do you think in part, and then we have a question here, in part that you were that hole, I'll call it a hole, in sort of the public knowledge um, about the truly awful consequences um, was in part a, a, a result of scientific reticence. Um, many scientists uh, who, who present the scenario thing well, like to dwell at the, at the median because, well, it's, it has the air of reasonableness. And this is something I've been criti of, uh, critical of myself. So, yeah, uh, critical of scientists who are overly reticent in how they go about characterizing the science and its impacts. Yeah, I mean, I, I think in general um, that's part of it. You know, scientific temperament is one thing, um, but there's also just, you know, many scientists don't have story, <coughs> storytelling tools that a journalist has, and um, sometimes they don't see the opportunities for storytelling about climate that um, someone else might see. Um, I think there's also the effect of you know, many people, Michael's, a, um, a, a, as I said before, a real hero for how he's done battle with the deniers. But there are also people who've been chastened by that experience. And even if they haven't done battle with it themselves, seeing their colleagues do battle with it, it's made them more and more cautious, which as scientists isn't necessarily a bad thing. If they want to be absolutely sure about what they're publishing, then that's good. That's what their jobs are. That's, you know, what their work is meant to be. But my perspective is, if some scenario is good enough to be published in the best scientific journals, really it should be good enough to share with the public and we should trust the public to process it in a responsible way. Um, you know, I think um, journalists want to help the reader along and maybe not um, give them, you know, maybe not spare them important context that may make them feel a little safer. But in general, if there's news out of science that's being published in, in really credentialed um, publications, I think it's, yeah, worth sharing more widely. Professor Fagan, I give you the privilege of the floor. Because it, I, and I guess I really wanted to follow up on Lee's last question and, and see if I can get you guys to, to expound a little more and maybe a little more deeply on the journalist version of Schneider's mm. double, mm -hmm. double Bind, which is that, yes, we're in this business because we think that journalism has a use uh, and that you know, journalism can be a, a, a positive force for solving societal problems, uh, for progressing. Uh, on the other hand, our first obligation, at least as I see it, is to reflect reality. Uh, so those of us who've been writing about environmental risk for decades, uh, and climate risk is the most existential of those environmental risks, uh, <laughs> I, I think are really, are really torn up about, about this problem of, of, of how to do it right. And I salute David for his piece because I think that all pieces of the bell curve should be written about, especially the middle section that's most likely and the most extreme because that's where the consequences are the highest. My problem with David's piece is that I felt like, my problem was not that it was gloomy. We're in the re reality reflecting business. That, that, that's our lane. Uh, my problem was, was much more that I, I felt like while you had some sort of boilerplate in there about 
likelihood, uh, it, it felt sort of tossed in, and, and it certainly wasn't part of the overall framing of the piece. And beyond that, there wasn't much about time. Uh, there, there, wa there wasn't a lot of information about, is this happening in five years? Is this happening in a century? You, you, you had it in there, but it, but it wasn't at the core of the piece. And so it, it, it violated <coughs> some of the rules that, that I've been teaching in reporting about risk in that, it, in my view, it was inadequately contextualized for, I think, very good reasons. It, yeah, I'm sure you are operating from the frustration that, that many of us feel that giving risk in all its nuance rarely moves people. But I wonder if now, in retrospect, after you've read all the commentary, whether, David, you feel like, yeah, if I was doing it again, I, I might have been a little more explicit about likelihood and time scale. And if you had done that, do you think it would have diminished the impact of the piece? Thanks. Well, thank you. I should. I wish I had said it earlier. Right, Dan. Thanks for hosting us. Thanks for. Um, thanks to NYU. Thanks to both of you. Too. Um, yeah. Um, well, the short answer is, um, I actually do think I was pretty good about time scale on the piece. I was pretty clear that I was talking about scenarios unfolding between now and 2100. Um, on the question of likelihoods. It's complicated. I mean, the, um, the, the factors that go into determining which of these scenarios we're, or how far along the track on each of these scenarios we get and at what point, most of, as I mentioned before, most of those factors are human. Um, there is scientific uncertainty around some of that. And I often think that casual readers use uncertainty as an excuse to focus on the sunnier half of the story and um, not worry about the, the darker possibilities. But to talk about whether we're going to get to, um, say, three degrees warming at 2050, at 2100, at 2200, um, those questions are almost entirely to be determined by the actions that we take going forward. And I think, therefore, very, very hard to talk about in any kind of concrete terms. So what I said in the piece was the UN projects that if we do not take action on carbon emissions, that we will get to about four degrees of warming by the end of the century. And they think that there's about a 5% chance that if that happens, we get to about eight degrees of warming. Um, I said that super explicitly. And it was those two benchmarks were important in each of the sections that I went through to talk about the effect on agriculture, the effect on public health, the effect on some of the most interesting work to me is about economic growth and conflict, which is also new research that may evolve a lot over the next few years. But, um, and I think beyond that, it's a little hard to talk about probabilities. This isn't, um, I mean, I'm very curious to know what, how Michael feels about this. But for me, it was very hard to think, you know, can I say this is like a 25% chance of happening by this year? Is this a 37% chance? Any numbers like that that I saw in any writing about climate seemed to me really arbitrary because all of the major factors, or I shouldn't say all, most of the major factors um, have to do with how we respond, what action we take on carbon emissions, you know, and other technological solutions that we may come up with. And it's really hard to talk about those um, you know, in any concrete way. So yeah, I'm, I'm sure. curious. I'm, strangely, I'm curious too, Michael, <laughs> what, what I, your response is. Because I am as he's well. making a very good point, <laughs> which is that um, now that the largest variable is human, as a journalist who covers these things, I mean, how am I supposed to sort of, you know, Navigate balance yeah. and, and feed that in? Like, yeah. should I, uh, you know, should the third paragraph be, but you don't really have to worry about this because, well, most of the time we rally at the last minute and do something creative and fix the problem. We don't know what it is here, but I'm sure something so, and then move on. I mean, that, how do we temper this, or should we? Yeah, I mean, so if-, if Humanity you know, and time. Well, if there, so if there was one central critique that I had advanced at the time on David's piece, it was that I, I, I wasn't convinced that it did do as good a job as I would have liked of distinguishing between the likely impacts and the worst case scenarios. And, and, and that's difficult to do. And, and I just wasn't sure that the reader 
would be able to go back and forth and keep that all uh, in perspective. But in you know, David's defense, that's a really difficult thing to do. To, these are difficult waters to, to navigate uh, for a scientist or a journalist because you're dealing, first of all, with the challenge that I think was, is at the center of what David is trying to do here. If you ask a scientist, how would you like to present information to stakeholders and policymakers? They would tell you, well, I would produce a probability distribution of the variable of interest and I would have them calculate, you know, where in that prob probability distribution they're willing to be and what the likelihood is of achieving that. Um, the way a scientist would go about it is not the way any normal human being would go about it. And so what we need to do is to figure out ways to convey that sort of information in a way that's accessible um, and digestible to somebody who does, is not versed in the technical jargon and, and, uh, and, 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 and formalisms of science. And one of the ways we do that, well, you know, we can't give somebody a probability distribution curve and expect them to know what to do with that. But we can try to give them what we think are the key points along that curve. And that's what David's talking about. Well, you have to tell them what the mean is or the median, sort of the center, but you have to give some sense of the, the tail of that distribution, the low likelihood but, but potentially catastrophic outcomes. And then you deal with the fact that there are at least two fundamentally different kinds of uncertainties here. There's the uncertainty that we control, what we choose to do, um, and there's the scientific uncertainty. Given our best scientific understanding of the climate system, um, there are still uncertainties in you know, the way clouds behave in a warmer climate, in how El Nino uh, will operate, on what will happen to hurricanes and tornadoes. There's enough scientific uncertainty as well that there are almost equal amounts of both. Um, if you look at uh, sort of, if you try to parse the, the uncertainty in future projections of global warming, about half that uncertainty is sort of what we call scenario uncertainty. It's what we choose to do. What path do we follow in our burning of fossil fuels, in our pursuit of renewable energy? And about half of that uncertainty is fundamentally scientific. We, we can't reduce that through human behavior. We just have to deal with the fact that we are making decisions in the face of uncertainty. But it brings us back to the, the, the same point. When you are making decisions in the face of uncertainty, you do need to keep in mind those low probability catastrophic outcomes. And David and I are in complete agreement with that. And it's really important to communicate that to policymakers and stakeholders. And one of my main critiques of the scientific community actually has been not properly conveying um, those, those potential outcomes. So we're much more in agreement than we are um, uh, in, in, in disagreement here. Um, and, and for me, it was simply a matter of how clear it was when we were talking about one and when we were talking about the other. Mm. But should we be communicating those you know, worst case scenarios? Absolutely. I think we would be, it would be a dereliction of responsibility yeah. on the part of climate scientists and uh, journalists to not do that. Oh, I, I, I should say, I think your, your, um, your differences are in a sense stylistic. And the stylistic difference is journalism versus science. I mean, would I would you, just say two, yeah, two things um, to build off what Michael was saying. Um, the first is, um, it, you know, goes back to we were talking about the, the fire insurance analogy, which is that, um, you know, if there's a 5% chance that we get to, I don't know, seven degrees of warming or six degrees of warming by the end of the century, um, that percentage chance is important to understand, but it's not like if we don't get it, we're going to be at one degree of warming where we are now. Um, so talking in this context about worst case scenarios is not just about um, you know, teaching the unlikely but possible and quite catastrophic effects. It's also showing the whole slope. Um, I think it's really, that's, re that's a really important point. Um, so whether, whether my article or other articles sort of overstate um, the possibility that we could end up in some really extreme scenarios is one question kind of for scientific debate, but in terms of what readers will, um, mm -hmm. will get from it, if they, if they learn that you know, we're on a slope in terms of heat stress that could lead to parts of the world being so hot that you couldn't really exercise outside without having heat stroke in the next 50 or 75 years, um, whether they think that possibility is five or 10 or 1% um, is on some level to me a little less important than knowing that we're on that slope to begin with. And that connects to the second point I would make, the second additional point I would make, which is that 
my article really stopped at 2100, and a lot of people writing about climate do that because it's really easy for people to understand. But like, the Earth is going to be around for many <laughs> centuries going forward. Maybe. That's the, yeah, that's the theory, right? Yeah. And, and that's the best case scenario. And especially when we talk about sea level rise, I mean, you know, we're going to have a lot of sea level rise if we take a perspective of many millennia. Um, and sort of freezing the story so it ends at 2100 is really actually misleading in some basic way. And yet it's difficult to get people to care about something that's even 20 years totally. in the future. Yeah. <laughs> but I care about this person who's been very patient <laughs> with the question. That's, that's quite all right. Um, so my, my question has to do with, you, you guys seem to have come to some sort of very lovely, honestly really lovely agreement mm -hmm. Is over this piece, yeah. and it's, it's been quite nice to hear about. Isn't it disappointing? However, um, I'm curious about the aftermath of publishing this story. Yes, I'm curious you. about the annotations that you ended up publishing. I'm curious about Dr. Mann's Facebook post, and yeah. essentially, what was your initial reaction to reading the piece, and what was your initial reaction to the popularity of the piece and then the ensuing reaction? And then, just because I really want to make sure I get this other question in, for Dr. Mann specifically, I'd like to know how much of the worry of climate scientists as a whole about um, talking about these worst case scenarios has to do with probability and how much of it has to do with the worry that you will be perceived as fear mongering. Um, and, and you know, our, our, cause I work on climate science for, for a living and I'm just wondering, when I talk to climate scientists about these worst case scenarios, how much of their hesitancy has to do with probability and how much of it has to do with, yeah. with just the being accused of, of just overblowing the facts? Two really good questions. And I may ask you to come back and ask the second one again. That's fine. Um, <laughs> uh, pushback. You want me to start? Uh, I think that's probably a good way to, to do it. OK. So because you did a, 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 she asked a question out of something I wanted to go into, which I thank you for, which is, as a publication, um, you and the magazine um, did a series of things um, after the piece ran. Um, I'd like you to tell us what the magazine did in response to whatever reaction you got, what that reaction was, um, and how you dealt with it. And I'll ask you some other Well, the reaction thing. was, first of all, overwhelming and deeply flattering. I mean, that was the, my basic experience of it was, um, first of all, the scale so many readers. Um, I was mentioning this to Michael earlier, but you know, we're trained in this business to think of climate as a kind of traffic kryptonite, and the story was the opposite. And I think that's really actually encouraging mm -hmm. for the cause, in addition to just being exciting as a writer to see. Um, and you know, most of the response that I got from readers was, again, quite positive, and it felt mm -hmm. really flattering. There are a lot of people who were saying, you know, I had some vague intuitions that the picture of climate change that I'd been fed was a little too optimistic, and this gave me some concrete sense of really where things are. Um, the response from scientists was more mixed than that, for sure, but I also heard from a lot of scientists <laughs> who were quite appreciative, um, some of whom I'd mm -hmm. interviewed and, and others who I hadn't. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and then there were those who, um, who were critical of the piece, including Michael. Michael, I think, was one of the first who wrote about it um, in that Facebook post. Um, and that experience was interesting in the sense that um, there were sort of two different sets of issues. There was like, there were some factual questions um, mm -hmm. that were raised, um, you know, most of which I think actually were like that a, a couple facts that weren't presented with the right context. They weren't exactly wrong, but they were just not, not presented to the reader in, a, in as responsible a way as they may have been. And we changed that quickly. Um, and then there was a sort of much bigger phenomenon of scientists like Michael, including Michael, who criticized the broader framing of the piece. And that seemed to me like a really interesting and important debate to have, how to talk about these issues. Mm -hmm. um, I was a little frustrated that those two critiques were sort of combined in a lot of places where there was writing about it. Um, it was like so scientific um, community like takes issue with the piece, which is, was true in a sense, but was mostly about the framing, I think, really, than, rather than the facts. And so, especially to answer, to answer that and to mm -hmm. focus the conversation on the question of framing and, and rhetoric and um, what kinds of writing about climate are responsible, we said, well, we know that every sentence in this article was, you know, came from somewhere. Um, 
it was, you know, went through a rigorous fact checking like everything we do does. And we thought, well, why not just put that out there and show, exa mm -hmm. show our work? Mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, it sort of seems intuitive, but it's actually a, um, a kind of unprecedented thing for a, a journalist to do um, at a magazine like New York, anyway. And so we rushed together, great help of um, brilliant fact checker Julia Mead um, and my editor David Haskell. Like, we basically sprinted for three days and put together this annotation. And, um, and published it along with a couple of the um, kind of corrections and clarifications that mm -hmm. we had, um, that had been raised. And I think that was really important in a number of, on a number of levels, but primarily because it allowed the ensuing conversation to really focus on this question of how we should talk about these issues, um, not whether this article was factually sound, but how we should talk about what we know mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. the worst case scenarios. And um, I think that's basically been the tone of the, to the extent that there's been an ongoing debate mm -hmm. in the months mm -hmm. since, has been really focused on that question, which I've yeah. been happy to yeah. see and excited to be participating yeah. in tonight. I was very intrigued when you all did that, and that you, uh, for those of you who, who didn't see that, they basically published, the, or republished, I guess, better way to put it, a version of the article and didn't change any of the language, but they um, did what you can do on the internet, which is create a document in depth with annotations that took you straight to the sources for sentence by sentence. And they published, I was particularly interested in this, a lot of the outtakes, interview, full interviews with people who'd been uh, scientists and other sources who had contributed to the article. Um, but instead of seeing the, the one quote that was used or whatever, you saw the 45 minute conversation and you saw how um, the thing had been explored and the, and the sort of like the trees from which the two by fours had been made. And I thought that was very interesting. We were actually planning on doing that before we published the piece. It really? wasn't a response to the response, mm -hmm. but it ended up being mm -hmm. an interesting part of mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. week. So you're half of the question. So this thing appears on the newsstand. I mean, why are you responding to them starting the New York Magazine in the first place? It's not like your normal thing. Mm -hmm. you, what, well. what, hit your, what hit your nerve? I mean, what, uh, what uh, other than his exquisite writing? But, um, I mean, it, 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 it was very well written. Um, I, I, no, I'm pretty active, you know, um, in, in engaging with sort of the, the larger public discourse on climate mm -hmm. change. And so I, I frequently do uh, comment on stories um, that, uh, you know, that appear um, that deal with the topic of climate change. And David's was certainly a very prominent one. Um, and it's one that I had contributed, I had interviewed with him. Right, um, so right. I was very interested to, mm -hmm. to see the story when it uh, appeared. And uh, again, you know, uh, one of the, my disappointments is the way that it is difficult to have uh, the sort of nuanced discussion we're having here mm -hmm. um, in, you know, in public, uh, online, in social media, um, things tend to devolve um, into, you know, uh, highly opinionated and, and often um, uh, animated uh, disagreements and debates. And, um, and, and one of the things that happens is, you know, I express some initial uh, um, you know, concerns or misgivings. Mm -hmm. And then there were others out there who attacked me for doing that. And I had to defend, you know, why yeah. that I had those misgivings. So I had to actually go into more detail. Mm -hmm. I had to uh, to, and that actually fed this this rift. Um, it was the process of others sort of coming in and adding to the mm -hmm. feeding frenzy that I think led to the appearance of a much greater rift between David and me than actually exists. And, and I still feel, um, you know, uh, I, I, I feel bad ab about that because it, it did, I think, it de detracted from the, the larger important message that David's piece Well, I should carried. just say that, I mean, the fact that anybody of Michael's stature, but including many other scientists who were engaging with it, were engaging with my work, was hugely gratifying and flattering. Even if they were taking issue with some of it, I was, I found the whole experience of being engaged in a public debate with these people um, really exciting, and I'm excited to be mm -hmm. continuing to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, so yeah. Same here, and, and, and I guess my, <laughs> my, my feeling was that, um, you know, that uh, I did talk both about the framing and uh, uh, about some of the you know, the, the, the science that I thought was somewhat selective, like on the methane uh, feedbacks um, and on sort of the satellite record. About where th there were certain things where I felt like the framing of the science actually did sort of serve 
the narrative, the larger narrative of things potentially being worse, more dire than we thought. And so I didn't see a clear separation between sort of mm -hmm. some of the issues mm -hmm. of the science and whether it was mm -hmm. right so, and so the part of your role, you felt part of your public role uh, as a scientist writing was to be a corrective. Yeah, but, uh, but, but not just uh, carping at details because I don't think that serves anybody's um, mm -hmm. goal here. Um, my, I, I was sort of, I think David and I are both similar in that, um, you know, our, we, we do have, uh, we're, we're both interested in the larger picture. We're both interested mm -hmm. in does this serve mm -hmm. the public discourse, does this inform this very important discussion. Yeah. Yeah. You guys are the public discourse. Yeah. Well, yeah. we were for a and, week. And <laughs> so is this gentleman here who's been very yeah. patient. You have a question, sir? Yeah, just to make sure I'm communicating effectively. <laughs> a, show, a show of hands, how many people here are feeling frustrated? They'd like to hear more about solutions, because I don't want to waste your time if you're not. It's only well, that's good. I should tell you, sir, that, that our interest here and the purpose of this uh, symposium is communication, although we're always happy to hear about solutions to communication. Okay. But if you have something that well, you'd I, like to... Well, I want to make sure I'm communicating people's wants and needs. So I want to Of course, sure. of course. Because I'm, I'm a tech activist. I'm a PhD psychologist, but I'm a uh -huh. tech activist. I'm a head of a startup uh -huh. that's focusing on solutions. And there's two premises be before I give you my question. One premise is a, a quote from Kurt Vonnegut, which is, if you know your history, American history, uh, he said, in the battle between the forces of good and evil, greed and compassion, there's only one thing that's ever made the difference, that's organizing. And I think it's obvious when we're talking about climate change, we're talking about greed, unfettered capitalism. Um, the other premise is that um, if the major grassroots organizations are going to have any success in the very near future mm -hmm. to be able to recruit the vast larger numbers of people they need to actually do much bigger tasks from willing to get arrested at a pipeline to willing to knock on 200 doors on a weekend mm -hmm. to get the right person elected, we're gonna need uh, some way of solving that problem. I call it the mother of all challenges. What can we do to get a lot more people willing to join groups to do a lot bigger things and just show up at a protest, which really doesn't do much, or even call a couple of members of Congress, although you all better call your members of Congress mm -hmm. tonight about this GOP right. tax scam. But the question <laughs> is, so we're developing an app that solves that problem and I just like to know before I'm not here to tout our app. Right. But we have two co-founder positions. Okay. What but do your you question think? Is. My question is, uh, what have you come across in your writings uh, that has excited you about some new ways to organize that could solve this mother of all challenges? That could recruit a lot more people to do a lot more courageous tasks. We have a solution to that, but I'd like to know what your ideas are, what you've come across, what you've heard that give you some hope. <coughs> I would just say it's interesting, most of the people who have asked me about what they can do in the aftermath of my piece were, have really been focused on personal consumption choices. I and call I, that the lifestyle delusion. I, I actually am totally with you and I, I feel like the main, the, what I always say is really organizing is the thing to do. Right. That the difference is made by individual lifestyle. It's good to live, live in a responsible way, but that political organization is, is overwhelmingly the um, the thing that's going to solve the problem right. if we're going to solve that's the problem. That begs the question, how can we organize a lot more cleverly in a lot bigger way? Well, I, personally, I think that, you know, first of all, I think the climate is doing a lot of the work for us. I mean, I think if you look at um, what's happened over the last six months, you know, the extreme weather, the hurricanes, the wildfires, I do think that the public is really waking up to climate change in a much more profound way than they ever have before. And I think it's important to keep in mind, given what I was saying earlier about the incredible speed with which we've created this problem, that there's also, you know, the fact that the public is aware at all and turned on at all should be on some level a cause for hope rather than a cause for despair. Um, it wasn't all that long ago that not many people even knew really what was involved in climate change. And now, ev you know, everyone I know um, knows about carbon emissions, knows about, you know, parts per million. Um, and that, that awareness and that engagement, I think, is only going to grow, especially as we start to see more and more of the really... Um, scary effects. Um, Michael? Yeah, I mean, I would underscore some of those points. Um, you know, you take something like gun control, there's overwhelming uh, uh, support among the American people, upwards of 90% uh, support for common sense uh, gun uh, legislation, and yet uh, we have a gerrymandered Congress which is unwilling to do anything um, uh, about the problem. And so, 
public acceptance and even public concern um, in the political system that we operate in today isn't always sufficient. It's necessary, but not necessarily sufficient for political change. Um, we know what Dante said about okay. those who know. I have, I have to, we got a line? Okay. <laughs> I have to ask two things. One, I have to ask our, our guests to stay focused on our viewers online, when, uh, resi resist the, uh, the cognitive uh, magnetic attraction of a real human being. <laughs> um, and next question. Well, I, I just want to say if anybody does want to look at a really right. amazing solution, it, ours is called Kickstarter plus peer-to-peer -peer bonding meets movement organizing. We have two co-founder openings uh -huh. to see me. It's called winwisely.org. Okay. And when this session is over, I'm sure there are a lot of us who'd be interested in talking to you about winwisely it. Winwisely.org. Yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> Please, next question. I have a very simple question about communication. So, <laughs> Michael, in your, um, in your response to the article, you made the point that uh, David didn't quote you, that he interviewed you, but he did not quote you. And so I'm wondering, you know, were, I mean, were you really pissed off about that? And David, I'm wondering, <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering from you, why, what made you decide to, you know, not include Michael in the article? Do you want to go first? Yeah. I, I I don't remember the context for that, so I can't really say. Um, uh, I was overwhelmingly much less uh, concerned about my own personal exposure. I, I, I have enough of that, uh, um, you know, uh, and my concerns were much more uh, just about whether the framing was right. I mean, David and I are both interested in the same thing um, and seeing sort of uh, public acceptance um, and, um, and that guiding uh, you know, policy towards uh, acting on this problem, and and my concerns were really whether this article would, would would serve that purpose optimally. So, David, just as a kind of technical matter, because a number of us here are either students of journalism or working journalists, how do you feel about the direct quotation? I mean, if you've talked to fifty people, I mean, uh, some people feel like well, I should quote something from all fifty of them to prove to my readers that I talked to all these people. Um, what's your stance? What do you, what do you, how do you feel? If you can digest it better than they can say it, shouldn't you do that? Well, usually a quote is better than uh, author summary, but it's also the case that in a lot of reporting, you're doing interviews that are, um, you know, much bigger picture conversations than you're going to want to actually detail in the story itself or you go off on a tangent and you end up talking about something that ends up being not a big part of the story, or you know, um, you know, the, the person happened to really talk around one point and was not quite clear in what they said. And um, I think there, I mean, there are a lot of reasons for not quoting someone who you interview. And on some level, I think it's a sign of the strength of the reporting, <laughs> the more people who are not quoted, because it just means the, ra the ratio of people you've interviewed to the people who show up in the mm -hmm. piece, the higher that is probably, the more, mm -hmm. the more informed mm -hmm. you are. Um, and the more informed you are in your thinking, in your writing, in your structuring of the whole story. So it's really, you know, one of the things that they beat into us, of course, is that it's one of the really important things for a journalist to communicate to his or her readers is, how do you know what you know? So if you are boiling down, and uh, as we all do, that many um, uh, interviews in the, in the sourcing unit was quite impressive. How do, you, how, do you, how do you signal to the reader that, you know, I've talked to a lot of people, and I and I, I know what I'm talking about here I mean, because, one, well, you know. One way is just to say exactly that, which <laughs> I did, which is a, a bit of a hacky move. But I said, you know, uh, over whatever, over the last few months, I've interviewed dozens of climate scientists, blah, blah, blah. Um, and another way was to publish these independent interviews, which we did that mm -hmm, week, mm -hmm. um, to at least highlight, I think it was only five or six, but to highlight mm -hmm. some really substantive, interesting, thoughtful conversations with a number of high-profile people, mm -hmm. um, not all of whom were in agreement with each other or sure. in agreement with yeah. me, but who um, gave a sense of the kind of reporting landscape that I was wandering on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You have a question. Been patient? I do. So this piece got so much attention, and that means that the, the audience that saw it became enormous. Um, I do a lot of work in conservation biology, and I'm aware that when I'm speaking, about half the people are already on board with what I'm saying, and the other half don't care at all. So in this context, I think you did a great job scaring people who already believe that climate change is real. And as you said, they might not know how bad it could be, but they, they're in. How do you respond to the other group? 
the people, how, how do you respond to the climate denialists who use your piece and some of the scientific pushback against it as proof that this entire issue is something overblown, that the media has overstepped and created a panic state? Well, my, I think I may differ slightly from Michael on this, but my feeling is that um, the more pressing problem when it comes to kind of climate communications mm -hmm. is making those people who are open to the possibility of action on climate much more um, committed to that project. That, you know, if, if you look at the data and say that, you know, 65, 70% of America believes that um, climate change is real and concerning, <laughs> if you could get all of those people to be really, really animated by climate change, that's more important than getting, than persuading 10, 10 or 15 percent of people on the margin that it's something to worry about if they're only going to start worrying about it um, in a very low level way. Um, but one other thing I would say in response to that, um, not so much about fear, but just the general message in question, I think we, we do often, we're a little narcissistic as Americans in thinking that um, the solution to this problem and the whole question really resides in our democracy. And while it's certainly true and important that Americans take action on, you know, we, this is something we need to take better action on than we have, it's also the case that overwhelmingly the problem is going to be solved elsewhere in the world, really by China and India, secondarily by Western Europe. And, um, you know, that the global question is a really different question than the American political question. We have an unusual case of climate denialism here. There are a lot of factors standing in the way of good climate action abroad, but they're not nearly as organized or as strong as they are in the US. And I think we sometimes get a little too focused on the question of you know, Republican intransigence. And um, I think that that can get in, get in the way of a kind of clear-eyed view of the big picture and what's important. So I, if I may paraphrase the question just a little bit for you, Michael. So from where you sit as a scientist slash communicator, do you get concerned that a, a frank and open discussion and frank and open reporting of uh, climate issues or a particular scenario or that scenario, um, that might be great and laudable in some respects, but it also just turns up a lot of fodder for the denialist community, and so therefore it's kind of working across purposes. No, I, I, I don't. Um, you know, I, I, I think we, we have to be willing to have frank discussions uh, with each other in public. I think it's important for uh, the public, for our audience, to, to have a sense of the sorts of discussions that do go on within the scientific <coughs> community because uh, our detractors have created a caricature, right, that we're all, you know, climate scientists, we're all just uh, reaffirming um, each other's work um, and this narrative of, 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 of climate threat so that we can continue to get government funds and we agree with each other and there's no debate and there's no dissension because we're all just trying to advance a common narrative of climate threat and that, that brings in, you know, and, and the irony of course is that many who are leveling that um, uh, accusation actually are getting quite a bit of money <laughs> for uh, arguing against the science. Um, scientists get ahead. Um, the way you get ahead in science, the way you, um, you know, get an article in one of the leading journals, Nature or Science, uh, uh, is by presenting something new, pr something we didn't already know. It isn't by simply saying, oh yeah, you know, the other guy or the other woman was right. Um, everybody else has already, you know, figured it out. That's not how you get a government grant to do new research. It's not how you get a, an article in one of the leading journals. So there is this give and take. There's this good faith debate um, and real skepticism, not fake skepticism, like those who call themselves climate change skeptics, but real skepticism is what Carl Sagan called the, the self-correcting uh, machinery that, that guides science forward. And it's important for the public to see that that's what real skepticism is, that that's how real scientists operate, that we're not afraid of uncertainties. Uncertainty is where interesting science resides. Um, the corpus of known scientific knowledge, we don't just go over that uh, again and again. Where we do our research, where we spend our time is at the periphery, um, the, the boundaries of the science, the things that we're not certain about. I think the more that we can make it clear to the public that that's the way science works, the, the more the, the public understands the actual culture of science and how science really works, the more difficult it is for those looking um, to malign the science and to malign the scientists 
to build up this straw man, this caricature of the way science is and what the way science works. So I think we lost our question there, oh. uh, to which I regret, um, <laughs> but perhaps it'll resurface. Um, I'm curious now, uh, the kind of lessons learned uh, aspect of this. Um, some of us are, are beginners, some of us could certainly use someone's advice about how to keep going um, and how to do this effectively. So I'm curious now, um, first from you, David, um, as someone who came to this topic as a relative uh, neophyte, if mm -hmm. I can use that word, um, uh, what have you learned as a result of this reporting experience that you would then package as advice to someone who was coming to it for the first time? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is not advice, which is just that I, I would not again use methane release from permafrost <laughs> as a, a way to illustrate you'd, the uncertainty. You'd use methane <laughs> release from livestock, I guess, yeah. which is, you know, the new one uh, that we're all um, remeasuring. Well, you know, I think, um, I think that the publish, publication of that annotation was really helpful, and I think that going forward, it could be a really exciting new model for how to do this kind of work. Um, you know, academics do exactly this when they publish, mm -hmm. and given the internet, journalists could do it too, to really, really show where everything that they're working mm -hmm. on is coming from. Um, I think that, you know, to some of the points that Michael made when he was writing about it originally, and to some of the points made in this room um, tonight, I think that um, it's probably important to keep in mind, um, you know, some of the, the, the broader context of probabilities and, and likelihood, and, and also keep in mind that readers may not be um, quite as reading quite as carefully as you are writing, and so to be really um, clear and um, un unmistakably clear about if you're writing about worst case scenarios, exactly what that mm -hmm. means, um, and then to you know to the extent that you can really show your work. Um, yeah, that's interesting. I, I want we have two questions, but I want to just. First, just quickly um, hear the, uh, your answer to the same question from the other side. A number of um, uh, people here are sciences who are yeah. interested in, in uh, uh, kind of taking the path you have taken as a communicator while right. trying to sort of do their real work. Right. And yeah. what advice would you give them well, in, the, in the same vein? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say, you know, um, not all scientists should be science communicators. Um, <laughs> many should not be. Uh, many, you know, many of us are, are most content or happiest and most productive, you know, in the laboratory doing the science, and that's great. But some of us need to leave the laboratory. I do think it's important that the voice of science enters into the larger discussion. And I wrote an op-ed in the New York Times a few years ago, uh, the title of which was, If You See Something, Say Something. And, and the point of that op-ed was that if scientists, um, you know, if, if we retreat from the, uh, you know, the, the public sphere, then we leave a vacuum that's going to be filled by uh, other voices, um, uh, you know, voices of, of those who are not disinterested, who have an axe to grind, who have an agenda to advance. And so um, it is important for us to be part of the conversation. Um, in my own view, uh, I don't think that my place is to try to prescribe what the solutions should be, but to inform the discussions of the threats, the threat, the risks that exist, and the solutions that exist. So, you know, if our Congress today was debating a carbon tax versus cap and trade, um, and the, the nature of incentives for renewable energy, um, rather than debating whether or not climate change is a hoax perpetrated by the Chinese, um, you know, to me that would be, that, that, that's where our discussion needs to be. What's the role of nuclear energy in the transition away from fossil fuels? Mm -hmm. These are legitimate things to be debating, but is climate change real? Does it represent a threat? There is no longer a legitimate debate to, to be had about that, and we do need to get past it. And let me make one more point, because yeah, it ties into something we were talking about okay. before. Um, I do think that it is important for the U.S. to continue to play a prominent role in global negotiations to solve this problem. Um, are, you know, who are we to tell, you know, the Chinas and the Indias, you know, it, we've had, you know, two centuries of access to cheap fossil fuel energy and we built um, uh, our, our nations of great wealth um, on, on that. And who are we to tell India and China that they're not entitled to that same source 
of, of, of cheap energy if we don't have our own house in order, if we are not doing everything that we can to solve the problem. So I do think it is important that the U.S. continue to in, play indeed. a prominent role. And, and who am I to tell these two people <laughs> that we're not going to have time to get to their questions? Good so point. please, please. Thank you. Both, both here is my Dr. Mann and David. Um, I'm curious on, from the journalist side, is there a way that um, what can be done to allow journalists to talk more openly about this, about the extreme scenarios? And then from the scientific side, uh, what Dr. Mann could, um, would it have helped to have David talk more about the solutions, you know, such as the victory plan um, that, I, uh, that, that you, you know, uh, advised us on? Um, well, I, I don't think, there, to answer the first mm -hmm. question first, right. um, I don't think that there's much standing in the way of uh, journalists doing whatever it is that they want to do. But then why, why hasn't it happened then? I think a lot, I mean, I, that's a, it's a complicated question. I, <laughs> um, it's a complicated question to answer. I think part of it has to do with the simple fact that um, I wrote the article that I wrote in part because I was coming at it new, as we talked about, and I was able to really take in the full scope of things. And I think many of the people who are most engaged and serious as climate reporters are doing a serial job of that. And I actually do think that if you read those people quite closely, you get a similar picture of extreme scenarios over time. It's just that the nature of their work is such that it's divided up over many pieces over a long period of time and really takes some focus to see the big picture. And the uh, second half of the question for you? Yeah, sort of a variant on the same theme. Um, I don't think it's the place of the scientists to tell journalists what they should write about and how they should write about it. Um, uh, I think uh, our role is to make sure that, um, that those pieces are as informed as they can be, uh, again, about what the science has to say, about what the risks are, uh, about what the solutions are. Um, to me, you know, that's, that, that's the sweet spot when I think of the role that I as a scientist can play in this discussion. And just one quick note about solutions, you know, it's a, an oversimplification, but I think it's true that there is one solution, and that is like curbing carbon emissions. We know that. Um, there's, you know, there are a lot of other ways we can go about addressing the problem, but it's not as though this is a mystery. What we need to do is get our carbon emissions under control, and the main thing that's going to change that is public policy choices. And the things that's going to drive that is public activism and organization. And going to the voting booth. <laughs> yeah. During and those midterm right elections. There? Hi, yeah, actually kind of piggybacking on that last comment of you needing um, mass public motivation for this change. Um, David, it's interesting that the most, one of the most powerful examples in your piece relies on people who are already feeling the effects of this climate change, people who are field workers. Um, but you already said in the beginning that this was written for people of your audience, um, New York Magazine readers. There's not a huge overlap of people who work in fields um, and are feeling the effects of climate change now in New York Magazine readers. And if you need people to motivate or to mobilize and get involved, we need a bigger outreach. And there has to be a way to get this message um, to individuals who are already feeling the effects now and will feel them <coughs> strongest uh, in the years to come. So I wonder if both of you could address that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a, it's a really important point. Um, I think one of the one of the reasons that we as Americans are sort of behind a lot of the rest of the world on climate is because for a lot of accidents of geography, we've been shielded from some of the worst effects. And um, many people in the rest of the world are feeling really, really horrible climate effects already. And um, to return to what Michael was saying a minute ago, it's especially true in the developing world and that there are um, many communities, cultures that are really mm -hmm struggling with climate change without the capacity to address, without the same capacity to address it that we have. And that is one of the big themes of this story at the moment and will be for the decades to come, the way that global inequality uh, maps onto climate change. Um, in terms of messaging to those people, I'm, you know, I, I don't know if it's like false modesty or fa false grandiosity for me to say, I don't really think it's my place to be writing articles for like the um, field workers in El Salvador. Um, I, but I do think that um, I, you know, I do hope that they have people writing for them where they are, for sure. Um, and I do hope that everywhere in the world, people who are feeling the effects, people who are not yet feeling the effects, have access to some kind of storytelling that showcases the risks. Michael, you had a 
Something you wanted to add there? Yeah, sure, yeah. I mean, I, I think there is a huge uh, ethical dimension to this problem, which is that the, the people who are feeling the, the, the worst impacts of climate change uh, already are those who had the least role in creating the problem in the first place. Um, and so there's, the, there's a huge climate justice um, aspect to the problem. And I think that that has actually gotten a fair amount of, of prominence um, in, in recent years. The, the sort of the, the justice, the environmental justice um, sort of uh, uh, element of climate change. And that's energized a constituency that um, you know, it, it is, is really important to energize um, if we're going to have uh, the sorts of elections that will produce politicians who actually want to do something mm -hmm. about these problems. Um, uh, I would also say that, um, and I, I, I repeat this now as a, as a mantra really, um, the impacts of climate change are no longer subtle, okay? Everybody is feeling the impacts of climate change. And here in the U.S., how many reminders, how many um, super storms, um, uh, including one that essentially destroyed uh, Puerto Rico that is still um, uh, finding it difficult to recover um, you know, months later. Um, from the impacts of an unprecedented storm, um, unprecedented wildfires, um, and it's touching people's lives. Uh, I, the other day, uh, a good friend of mine, I learned that their uh, parents lost a house in the Napa wildfires. Um, and so we are now reaching the point where the impacts of climate change are so near and so evident that people we know are actually being impacted. And I think that's changing. I think that's a game changer when it comes to the, the sort of dialogue that we need to have if we're gonna confront this problem. Well, I have a problem, <laughs> which is Oops. that we are now sadly out of time. And um, I don't know how to tell you what, um, a, a thoughtful and compassionate and honest um, conversation we've had here with the two of you. And you've made me see some things differently. And I suspect uh, our audience here and in the virtual world as well. Um, you two have gone to enormous trouble to kind of do this for us. Uh, I want to thank you both very, very much because it's this kind of conversation as it broadens both through um, personal conversations, but also through the uh, voices that we strike um, publicly in the media, as such as we are. Um, those are the things that take us forward. You've taken us some of the distance tonight. Thank you very, very much. Well, thank you. Thank you.